In fact, the biological communities around these seeps have adapted over time to very small amounts of oil and methane in their environment. Whoa, like... What do you mean? At the very base of the food web, bacteria actually use the oil and gas from the seep to get their energy. And then they provide energy for other animals in the deep sea community. The oil and gas deposits have helped create a unique ecosystem here that provides a home to all kinds of unusual sea life. OK, thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's indeed a pleasure to introduce Mandy Joy. and. Uh, by way of a few introductory re remarks, Mandy Joy is a micro microbiologist, deep ocean explorer, vocal environmental advocate, and currently Regents Professor at the University of Georgia based in the Department of Marine Science. She is an expert in microbial geochemistry focused on hydrocarbon and trace gas dynamics. Mandy works in the blue water in nearshore ocean ecosystems her research has led to her mastery and integration of areas of analytical chemistry, microbiology, and geology. After her first submersible dive in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, this was in 1994, Mandy got hooked on deep ocean exploration, and she has been studying the microbiology of natural seepage of oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico ever since. Mandy is director of the Gomery-sponsored EcoGig Research Consortium that explores the impacts of fate of natural and anthropogenic oil in the Gulf of Mexico. This has been a major and very successful undertaking. Despite having grown up on a farm, Mandy fell in love at a young age with the ocean and many of its inhabitants, ranging from planktonic critters to dolphins. Scuba diving as an undergraduate was decisive for her move to ocean ecosystems. Mandy's honorific awards are many, including fellowship in the American Geophysical Union, the American Academy of Microbiology, the Association for the Science of uh, Limnology and Oceanography, and the AAAS. She tends to feel that luck played a large role in her being able to take advantage of key opportunities as they come along. But as an eminent mathematical colleague of mine was often heard to say, luck comes to the prepared mind. This is definitely Mandy. Thank you so much, Bert, for that warm introduction. And thanks for inviting me to, to talk to you today on behalf of the microbial sciences community um, that's been supported by Garmin for the past 10 years. Um, I hope I do everyone justice, and I apologize in advance for not being able to fit all the slides in. Even I can't present 70 slides in 25 minutes, um, but I'm going to try to present 30, so work with me on that. So I want to talk to you today about some of the major lessons that we've learned in terms of microbial dynamics in the past decade of, of Gomery Science. And I'm going to focus on a, a few big picture messages, then I'm going to talk about some of the surprises. I'm going to spend some time um, discussing a point that, that John Farrington raised earlier about baselines and, and understanding sort of what I call system state. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about moving forward and why microbiology is really the wave of the future um, in terms of solving a variety of global problems. So before Deepwater Horizon, you know, I've been studying oil and gas my entire career. And I remember a reporter once said to me early on in this bill, he said, boy, what you did must have seemed just so esoteric to most people. It didn't really matter. Why, why do you do it? Why did you do it before deep water? You know, how did you, how did you stay interested in it? Um, it? It's because these organisms are fascinating. Um, oil and gas degradation are very rarely done by one organism in isolation. It's, uh, it's often done by consortial associations. And these consortial associations um, are shown in this little cartoon that we produced uh, for a paper. Um, I think it was the oceanography issue of, of Gomery a few years ago of, of, of bioscience that Gomery put together. And these organisms essentially work together to break down complex oil. And this picture also has dispersants on the side. And I'll talk a little bit about dispersants, but, but not a lot uh, in this talk. Um, but prior to Gomery, our understanding of oil, degradator, oil degrading bacteria were, was fairly limited. And our understanding of the regulation was incredibly uh, limited. Um, this is just a, a 
tree that shows you the major uh, groups of oil degrading bacteria and gamma proteobacteria, most oil degraders are gamma proteobacteria. And we know that some uh, fall within uh, bizarre clades of archaea now, but, but most of the, the Arabic bugs are, are in these um, gamma proteobacteria. And prior to Gomri, we had not really been able to take a systems uh, biology approach of, of looking at oil degrading microbial communities. And that was because really the tools weren't available and the ones that were available were very, very expensive. So the Deepwater Horizon was the first environmental disaster where genomics was widely, uh, widely applied um, to solve critical problems. And I don't have time today to give everyone sort of a, a race car course in environmental genomics, but let's just suffice it to say that we can now sequence D DNA um, in a sample um, at much lower level, we can, we can detect much lower levels than we used to be able to detect, and we can sequence it much more cheaply than we used to be able to sequence it. Um, if, at the beginning of Gomri, it was thousands of dollars to sequence a sample. Um, now NovaSeq is $115 a sample uh, to sequence uh, deeply for metagenomics. So a lot has happened in the past uh, 10 years, and Gomri sort of evolved with the field uh, of, of environmental uh, genomics. And I'm going to talk today about some of the more um, transformative discoveries that have been enabled by, by genomics. I'm going to show you an example from single cell sequencing. I'm going to show you um, a sam uh, an example that involves metagenome assembled genomes, and I'll, I'll describe that for you. Um, I'm going to describe some sort of um, using genomic data to target specific genes to, to discover novel aspects of communities and, and their genetic capabilities, and I'll give you examples uh, all along the way. All right, so the first, the first discovery that I think surprised many people, myself included, um, was this, the role of the rare biosphere. And the rare, the rare, there's a paper published in PNAS about five years before the Deepwater Horizon by Mitch Sogan and his colleagues up at the Marine Biological Lab, um, describing that there was this group of microorganisms that they coined as the, deep, the, the rare biosphere. They were present across the globe, um, ubiquitously, in low abundance. So these organisms are everywhere, all the time, but they don't seem to be abundant uh, under most circumstances. They're, they're, they're there um, in small numbers. And the rare biosphere of, of older graders are in these little tiny blue bars right here. So they account for between 2 and 7 percent of the microbial community in the Gulf of Mexico. And if you were to go to the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean or the Arctic Ocean or the Antarctic, um, you would find percentages anywhere from 1 to 4 percent for older graders. So there's a, they're a little bit more abundant in the Gulf than they are in other places, um, but they're abundant everywhere. What happened during the Deepwater Horizon is that the infusion of oil into the system generated an explosion of abundance of these gamma proteobacteria, these oil degraders. And we were lucky um, because we had been working in the Gulf of Mexico for some 15 years before Deepwater happened, but we weren't just lucky because we'd been working in the Gulf of Mexico. We'd been working at a site 10 nautical miles up the canyon um, from, from MC-252 and MC Lease Block 118, and these were our time zero samples. Um, these were collected on March the 20th, a month to the day before the well exploded. Um, so these are our background samples. This is the explosion of gamma proteobacteria from the rare biosphere. And then you can see that over the course of the next year or so, it looks like the community goes back uh, to the baseline state, except it doesn't. Using a bioinformatics technique called ecotyping, we were able to show that, in fact, those some of the organisms that were abundant um, before the spill um, persisted. Here's Coelia. Um, in some cases, the ecotypes that were dominant um, before the spill didn't respond at all uh, during the spill. They were replaced by other organisms. Now, this is interesting because you can think of this as a community of, say, um, 40 people of, of different races and genders, and they go to a party, and the ones who really like to drink beer um, stay a long time, and the other ones, um, they go away. So the yellow guys, they really like to drink beer, and they stay at the party forever. Um, these guys don't. They're teetotalers, and they, they, they sort of disappear and get diluted out. So these, the, the fact that these communities responded so differently, um, each, each species shows a different type of response, was very surprising to us. And this is data between 2010 and 2012. So there was a two-year perturbation uh, in these microbial communities, and we've since sequenced a bunch more samples. Those, those data are being prepared for publication. And in fact, in some cases, some of the species never go back uh, to this 
quote unquote baseline state. Um, they stay perturbed. In cases for Coelia, which is sort of my superhero favorite organism, and not just because it's named after Rita, um, this organism is fascinating because there are, there are 25 ecotypes of Coelia. Two of them dominate in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this, this little gray bar here and this teal bar here are the two dominant um, ecotypes of Coelia. This guy really loves to eat oil. Um, this one seems to respond better to dispersants, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, but, but you can learn a lot about the ecology of the system and the biogeochemistry of the system just by looking at the microbial uh, populations. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about dispersants in this talk except for this slide and one more later um, because I'm giving a talk on Wednesday about dispersants and if anybody wants to hear it, they can come uh, hear it then. But I wanted just to point out that, and, and not for the, for, for the sake of this being a dispersant experiment, we can reproduce that bloom that occurred in the field in the laboratory um, by mimicking conditions that we see in the field. We can perturb the system with oil and get the same bloom of gamma proteobacteria uh, in the laboratory. And the thing that's really interesting is the time scale at which we see that bloom occur in the laboratory is almost identical to the time scale that we saw the bloom in the field. So that tells us that we're doing something right in the lab experiments because we're able to reproduce um, the dynamics of these key players. But you can see in this, in these, in this slide, th these are the Coelia bars again, and you can see these different groups of Coelia coming in amongst the different treatments because they have different substrates that they favor. And Coelia is, is a really good example. Another one is Marinobacter, these purple bars, uh, which come in um, in oil uh, amended treatments. But it wasn't just our experiments who, who documented the, the, the role of the rare, the rare biosphere. Um, there have been an abundance of, of papers published that show the importance of, of the rare biosphere. In fact, the first paper that was published in Science in August of 2010 on the, the microbiology of the oil spills out of Terry Hazen's group, and Olivia followed up um, on, on that talk and on, on, that, on that publication with this paper. And what, that, what she showed is that these are plume samples from the deepwater plume. And this is uncontaminated uh, seawater, proximal plume, and distal plume. And you can just see that these have been completely taken over uh, by these gamma, uh, oil oxidizing gamma proteobacteria. There's rapid, rapid community shifts um, that, that tend to be the message of these sorts of data sets. Now, sort of the second story following the, the rare biosphere uh, story is the role of, of microbial dynamics in forming this marine oil snow or microbial oil snow. Um, this was something that we witnessed firsthand because we, we were out on the water on May the 5th um, with, with Vernon Asper and Arna Dierks on the Pelican, and there was just so much goop on the surface of the water. Just, and not just oil, you know, you, as a microbiologist, goop is a good thing. It's just microbial biomass on the surface, chewing down on this oil. When we went back out on the Walton Smith at the end of May, it was all gone. It had just fallen out of the water, and we couldn't understand how exactly that happened. So we went into the laboratory, and we isolate, we took some, some surface oil, we put it into um, one liter seawater, sterile seawater, and over the course of just 21 days, we got these amazing slime stringers with emulsified oil. The little black droplets in here are emulsified oil inside these biosurfactant um, stringers. And these organisms produce biosurfactants that emulsify the oil and facilitate uh, biodegradation of the oil. Now, we went a little bit crazy um, with, with these oil slick samples, isolating organisms. And you're going to hear a little bit more about some of this work on Wednesday, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but when you isolate, um, or DNA from these, from these stringers and sequence it, you see a couple of interesting things. The dominant organisms in this particular sample were Halomonas and a Cyclocyclasticus, um, both gamma proteobacteria. bacteria, um, but it turns out that the Halomonas uh, produces the biosurfactant. Cyclocyclasticus does not. It's just a hitchhiker. It just lives in the, in the, in the um, slime because it, it's, there's oil there that it can, that can, that it can degrade. Um, but we found that we could produce, again, very easy, we could re, re, repl replicate in the lab what we see in the field. We've got eight genomes from pure cultures of organisms um, that we've isolated, and we have 25 single amplified genomes, which I'm not going to have time uh, to talk to you about today. Uh, but these, we have two, two uh, Marinobacter isolates, Altramonas, Halomonas, uh, Cyclocasticus, Pseudoaltramonas, et cetera. Um, Cyclocasticus is the only 
strain that we've isolated that does not produce marine oil snow. All the rest of them do. We know that these organisms all degrade hydrocarbons. They're very, very interesting. You can see here, um, this is just stained with Alcyon blue, so you can see the, um, the biosurfactant. And on, on Wednesday, if you're interested in this topic and you want to learn more, uh, one of the PhD students from my group, Rachel Storo, is going to talk about, a, a give a comparative genomics talk um, on these organisms that focuses primarily on their ability to degrade hydrocarbons and their ability to metabolize nitrogen, as it, as it turns out. Um, nitrogen was sort of the first thing I did as a scientist. I worked on the nitrogen cycle before I started working on hydrocarbons, and it turns out that nitrogen, is, nitrogen cycling is a really, really interesting story in every single strain uh, that we have isolated in the lab. Okay, Olivia Mason was a postdoc at JGI when the, or at Lawrence Livermore, working at JGI, uh, when the oil spill happened, and she did some really fascinating work um, on metatranscriptomics and metagenomics, and I'm just going to talk about um, one example of that, and that's her single cell um, genomics work for, for Coelia. Um, this organism, again, is, is just very, very fascinating. It's motile. It apparently has gene cassettes for carrying out aerobic or aerobic uh, gaseous hydrocarbon degradation, potentially methane, ethane, and propane, which is fascinating. There's not an organism known that does that, and if, any, if I had to put money on one that could, I would put my money on Coelia. Um, it has the ability to acquire metals and nutrients with real, really high affinity um, uh, systems, um, but it doesn't have sidere for uh, production capability, which is surprising because a lot of wool degraders do. Um, it has genes for aerobic nitrate respiration, anaerobic nitrate respiration. Again, not surprising, just about every uh, old degrader that strain that we have has the ability to respire nitrate when oxygen is limiting. Um, and it also has lots of genes associated uh, with biosurfactant uh, production. And what this information does for us is it tells us how we can potentially better tweak um, the, in, the native microbial populations, make them happier, and help facilitate their ability to degrade oil uh, during oil spills, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Another fantastic example of Gomri enabled science is the work that has that's been done by uh, Karthikeya Nadal, which she's going to speak as a plenary speaker in our session on genomics on uh, Wednesday. She's a PhD student at Georgia Tech with uh, Costas Constantinidis, and she has done some phenomenal work with, with beach sand samples in, in collaboration with Joel Koska and Marcus Udall. Um, and what she did was she, she pulled out of all of this metagenomic data, she reassembled a metagenome assembled genome. And what they, they we, ha, we call this now genome enabled isolation. Um, and using the genomic data, they were able to actually isolate this organism and characterize it. And they've given it uh, the name Macondomonas diazotrophica. It's a gamma proteobacteria, not surprising. Um, it has, it's a new genus and species. Its closest relative is 91.8% similar, which is pretty, pretty amazing. It's pretty different. Um, it can fix nitrogen. It grows on hexadecane as its sole carbon source. And in oiled Pensacola sand beaches, it was sometimes up to 30% of the microbial population. Um, but they found, as is shown here, it's globally distributed. So this is an incredibly important organism in terms of oil degradation globally, but it was not known to exist uh, prior to the Deepwater Horizon. Okay. So I want to give a switch gears a little bit in, in, in terms of now we're going to talk about uh, microbial activity and chasing novel microbial populations. And there's a second message in, that I want to share with you, and that is that when you think about microbiology, um, one of the first things that you think of is that it's, it's just fast. Microbes are fast. They reproduce quickly. They, they move around. They're just they're interesting organisms. They're fast. Um, so it was very surprising to me to, to sort of come to grips mentally and intellectually with this idea that some of these signatures that we saw microbially persisted for long periods of time. And for me, persisting for a long period of time for a microorganism might be a month or two, not two or three or four years. That's a long time in an ocean system where the water is moving. So we did some work tracking methane oxidation, methane dynamics following the deep water plume. And these are the sites that we worked at. Um, there were many, many stations and many, many cruises. And understanding the fate of methane was very important because the methane gas all stayed in the deep water plume. It was around 250,000 tons of methane that was released. And we wanted to find out what happened to it. So we chased it around uh, the system. We found that over the course of, of a two year period, um, the blue dots are early in the incident, so less than 70 days. Um, the lighter colors are later in the incident. 
So this is the deep water plume. You can see that plume being dispersed through the water column and mixed through the system. This is methane oxidation rates over here. The rates were very, very high, the highest rates ever reported for any system on Earth, actually, um, up to micromoles uh, per liter per day. Um, dropped down to, base, to, to lower levels um, in July, um, despite the fact that methane concentrations were still about 100 to 1,000 times uh, above background. But looking at the microbiology of this incident, it, incident it was really fascinating. What we saw when we sequenced, sequenced the 16S gene was that there was this novel clade uh, of organisms that came in uh, and dominated the population. We also saw the same clade in metatranscriptomes. Um, but this novel group of organisms had a really interesting and distinct um, particulate methane monooxygenase gene, and they dominated the system um, during the, the period of highest methane oxidation and highest methane concentrations. So this, again, is an example of this rare biosphere phenomenon, but it shows you um, a hint at a really interesting story because these guys persisted in our libraries um, for a couple of years, and I had a PhD student um, that went on, I forget how many cruises, I think 11, um, and did a lot of uh, work on methane oxidation. But a study like this one would never have been possible without funding uh, through a program like Gomri because we were able to actually track um, the fate of methane through the system, not for a year or two or three, but for seven years. Um, and when we did that, we found something truly remarkable. So here are baseline methane oxidation rate data. So this is methane concentration, oxidation rates, and rate constants. And what you see is that here's sort of the baseline. Um, Deepwater Horizon is obviously an anomaly. Concentrations drop back down to normal pretty quickly. They were approaching normal in 2011, and they were normal in 2012. Methane oxidation rates stayed elevated um, all the way up to 2012. Now, we do these rate measurements by adding um, methane tracer. So we're a little bit stimulating activity, some people might say, by adding methane tracer. <clears throat> But the methane, the rate constant is, not, is, is concentration independent, and the rate constant stayed elevated for three years. So the, the ability of water in the Gulf of Mexico to oxidize methane stayed elevated for three years after the methane source had shut off. So how does that happen? I don't know. I think it's fascinating. I think one of the, clearly microbial biomass is physically dispersed. Um, Ana Luisa Bracco's physical model of the system shows that the biomass is going to be moved across the system very effectively. And, but how's the population maintained for so long? Um, we know that in terrestrial systems, methanotrophs can go to sleep. They basically go into a resting state, and when they're given substrate, they wake up pretty quickly. So maybe these guys are just cruising around with the water. We don't really know, but the potential for activity stayed elevated for a long time, and that's quite interesting. Similar work was done um, chasing dynamics in beach sands by Joel Koska's group and Marcus Udall here, uh, who are both here today. I don't think Koska's is here, but those two are here. Um, they looked at the fate of oil on Pensacola Beach, and one of the students working on that project, uh, Will Overholt, found that in this layer where there was elevated uh, concentrations of oil, the community shifted. And here it's shown here. This was, again, um, the, the magic organism Marinobacter. Um, so here's the, the increase of, of gamma proteobacteria. And what you can see is over the course of time, you see this big shift in community, and then the community um, rebounds and re relaxes back uh, to, to a more baseline state. So in the beach sands, there was a fairly rapid recovery. In the open water, uh, not so much. Now, we also wanted to look at um, this, this, I've told you a little bit about this marine oil snow. This is a picture from uh, early May in 2010, and these are those streamers, those, that biological goop uh, that I was mentioning before. Well, we know that between um, May and September of 2010, um, much of this material ended up uh, getting deposited uh, to the seafloor around the, the, the wellhead in a, in a very large area. This is a paper that Jeff Chanton published um, in 2014. It's about 8,400 8, square kilometers of, of sediment uh, was, was covered by this oily um, residual layer. So we took, we took samples um, from 2010 up to 2018 to track uh, the, the microbiology of these layers. And I'm just going to give you a little snippet of what that looks like because it's really fascinating. Um, so this is a principal uh, coordinate analysis of beta diversity uh, from metagenomic data from samples collected at the wellhead. And what you can see is these are our background samples uh, from May of 2010. This is from uh, 
November and December of 2010, May of 2011, August of 2011, and then 2012 through 2017. And what this shows you is essentially a perturbation, a relaxation, a movement to a new steady state, and then a gradual movement back towards um, this steady state or this, this pre-baseline condition. But what's fascinating about this is that not only did the system sort of get completely perturbed and have to reset itself, when it reset itself, it stayed fairly stable uh, for five years and is very, very gradually moving back uh, towards this, this point over here. Um, this, was, this, was something, this is something I'm very excited about. There's gonna, Jason Westrich is giving a poster um, talking about this on, on Tuesday. But these data are some of the first that really show how the, the deep water sediment uh, communities around the wellhead evolved in response uh, to, to the oil spill. Okay, so we also did, um, through EcoGig, a good bit of work on microbiomes in general in the Gulf of Mexico. I've talked a little bit about the water column, I've talked a little bit about the sediment, I've talked a little bit about beaches. Um, I'm not gonna have a chance to talk about uh, salt marshes for lack of time. I, I did get some slides, but I'm not gonna have time to show those. But I wanted to basically talk a little bit about some of the work that we did um, in the coral uh, microbiomes. And this is Sam Vosen's work. Sam is also giving um, an invited talk in our genomic session on Wednesday. But what Sam did uh, for his PhD at Penn State was to characterize the microbial community of these deepwater corals. He sampled lots of different kinds of corals. You can see them in the background, um, 421 colonies, some shallow, uh, some deep, and he had water and sediment samples as well. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a take home message. Um, some coral species were dominated by a single microbe. Some had complex and dynamic communities. Um, but this, 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 um, Leopathies had a single microbe, um, Caligorgia had a single um, microbe, and the Paramaricea, which is, which is one of the more interesting ones, has actually a, a single microbial associate uh, that dominates uh, the microbiome. It's a SUPO5 organism. These are sulfur oxidizing organisms. Uh, we don't really, um, this, this is a paper that we're, that's being written right now, um, but I think you'll be really interested in, and I want to steal Sam's thunder even though I'm having to bite my tongue, because uh, it's really cool. But this is, a, this is a really exciting story, and he's going to tell you about it on Wednesday, so please come uh, and hear about that. Okay, so John was talking this morning about baselines. I'm perfect. I, three minutes. I could, I could get through this in two if I talked fast. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I, I joked with Rita a few months ago. I said, you know, the, the saddest part for me about the gummy program coming to a close is that I feel like I'm finally to the point where I have enough of a system understanding that I'm asking the right questions. Um, because before we were asking interesting questions, but they weren't necessarily the right questions to be asking. And now I think we know what the right questions are. And, and one of the things that I've learned is that, um, understanding not just the baseline, that's another conversation, but, but interpreting your data in, in, in the context of the system state and considering multiple stressors is really important. Um, we, know, we all know about climate change, um, and, but when most, most papers that were published on microbial dynamics in the Gulf of Mexico were, were targeted about a specific thing. We found this organism, we did a metagenome, we did a metatranscriptome. There, there, many of them lack uh, context. And there's been a lot of, of results that were very controversial. Um, a, a good example of that is the impact of dispersants on oil degradation. Sometimes you do experiments and you see inhibition. Sometimes you do experiments and you don't see inhibition after the addition of, of dispersants. And it occurred to me at some point about two years ago um, that, that maybe this was because there was another factor that was playing a, cre a critical role that we were missing. And, one thing that's really important that we really haven't gotten into yet is temperature, um, because the surface of the Gulf of Mexico is cooking. The last five years have been anomalously hot, and I don't mean just warm, hot, several degrees centigrade above the long-term average, in some cases up to four to five degrees centigrade above the long-term average. So temperature is probably going to play a big role, but nutrient stress um, plays a plays an incredibly uh, significant role. This, this figure is taken from a paper that was published in Frontiers a couple of years ago by Leo Lepent Pendleton uh, et al. And it was written about corals, but many of the concepts in the paper are applicable for, for microbial populations. And her, her point in this figure is that as, as, as one stressor changes, the impact of another stressor might, might respond in a very different way. So 
We took this, this idea and we did some, some new um, dispersant experiments in the past few months. And I'm just going to show uh, one uh, figure that, that gets at this. And I'll talk about this more on, on Wednesday, as I said. Um, oil oxidation in the Gulf of Mexico is so incredibly nutrient limited that nothing else really matters. It's all about nitrogen availability. And organisms that are nitrogen replete could care less if there's dispersant in the water. The, dis the effect of dispersants on these organisms is, a, is an absolute function of, their, of the relative re stress level of the cells. And I say that absolutely because we've done this with pure cultures. We can grow pure, pure cultures up under nutrient replete conditions and expose them to oil and dispersant and they oxidize oil very, very effectively. If we grow them up under nutrient limited conditions, they can, they have a, they are negatively impacted by dispersants. And here in this figure, this is oil plus dispersants. You can see the blue line here, um, much lower activity, but this is just oil plus nutrients. Um, and this is oil and dispersants plus nutrients. And these are the treatments without nutrients down at the bottom. So you can see that nutrients make a big difference. And understanding that rel the relative role of these multiple stressors is, is critically important. So I'm going to wrap up and, and, and end with uh, um, a couple of comments. So the, the idea of this rare biosphere and understanding the metabolic potential of the rare biosphere um, is, is critically important for understanding the role of, of any of the response of any environment to env environmental perturbation, uh, but it's particularly important for, for studying oil uh, in the environment. I think it's fair to say uh, that we, we hypothesized early on that the Gulf of Mexico was primed for hydrocarbon oxidation because it gets this slow, steady dose of hydrocarbons from natural seepage. And the work that we've done and that others have done in the past 10 years has, I think, proven that that is, in fact, uh, the case. Um, one of the most surprising things uh, that we've, we've seen and others have seen is that these microbial perturbations can be very long-lived uh, within an ecosystem um, it, with respect to both community compositional changes and activity changes. They can last for years um, in the system. And examples of, of that include these altered uh, pelagic ecotypes, which persisted for up to four years after the um, oil spill, the uptick of, of methane oxidation, the persistent uh, elevation in rates for three years after the oil spill, and this new stable state uh, that we've observed in these oil, these oil snow layers on the seafloor, they all point to the long-term consequences of, of microbial perturbations. Um, Joel Koska's group and, and, and my group have both shown uh, that hydrocarbon exposure alters uh, nitrogen cycling in the benthos. I'm going to give you a little hint. Um, in beaches, it stimulates nitrogen fixation. That's been published. In the deep sea, it stimulates denitrification, which is fascinating. Um, we, know that organ oops, we know that organisms that produce marine oil snow play a critical role in not just the biodegradation of oil, but in the fate of that material by stimulating uh, sedimentation to the seabed. And finally, um, microbial data must be interpreted in the context of system state and stressors to truly understand the dynamic. Uh, John spoke earlier about putting everything together with big data. I think that's really where we're headed. We're, getting, we're to the point now where we've got really in-depth, detailed data. Um, we can basically, our metagenomic data is like Ryan's um, FDI CRMS spectra for his hydrocarbons. It's deep, it's complicated, it's really, really amazing to, to dig into it, but interpreting those, those kinds of data sets uh, hand in hand is, 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 is the way of the future. And finally, I think it's fair to say that omics-enabled microbiology is an underappreciated response pool that sh the tool that should be widely employed and, and implemented in future response strategies. These organisms give you, if you, you, you can, because they persist in the environment after the oil is long gone, you can actually see places that were impacted um, after the signature of the oil has, has vanished from the system. And it's not just oil spills uh, where microbiology matters. Um, I want to end with this. Um, we've, we've talked a little bit today about microbes to the rescue um, in the case of oil spills and, and the role of microbes in degrading oil spills. Um, but microbes are also sentinels. And they're sentinels of changing environments because they grow fast and they respond fast. Um, but this is a, a, a table that, and, and I don't expect you to, to have time or, or vision to read it, it's small print, um, but this was published in, in Nature Reviews Microbiology uh, in last August by um, Michael Cavillacci et al. And this is a consensus statement by, I think now there's 1,500 microbiologists signed on to it, um, but when it was published there were about 50 uh, on the publication. 
But what, what this group is trying to do is just bring attention to the fact that looking at micro microbial communities tells, tells us a lot about not just microorganisms, but about the systems. And knowing how microorganisms change, respond to changing environmental conditions can allow us to, to use them as sentinels and we can be microbial detectives and, and discover perturbations and impacts uh, that might otherwise uh, stay hidden from view. So with that, I will uh, just thank the Gomery Board again for inviting me uh, to, to speak to you today. Thanks to all of the members of the microbial sciences community in Gomery who shared data with me. Um, I hope I did a decent job of presenting it and I'm happy to answer any questions. So I'm Dennis Wiesenberg, a member of the research board and I'll moderate the questions. If you have questions, please write them on a card and send them forward. So, so one question I have is that you talk about the organisms as sentinels and there's the Taylor oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico or the oil leak that's coming up. And how would you expect the organisms there to be different perhaps or, or respond? Or are they responding all the time and active uh, in the Taylor oil leak area? Sure, so we, we actually sampled Taylor, I think at least once a year for six years. And so we have, and we've done a lot of experiments there. And Taylor is really interesting because it's close enough to the mouth of the Mississippi that it's got a high nutrient load. Um, so the oil degradation rates are not nutrient limited. It's very unusual for the Gulf of Mexico. Well, it's usual for near shore, but not offshore. So the oil is degraded pretty rapidly there, but because there's a large population of oil degrading bacteria in the water column, you get a lot of deposition to the seabed. So there's, there's mosfa-like material on the seafloor around the Taylor site. And that, you know, we've, we've done a little bit of sediment work there. Um, you see similar trends in the sediment. We don't have a pre, obviously. We didn't start working there before 2004. Um, but sites like that um, promote robust responses in the microbial communities. Another question has to do with pressure. And pressure has an effect on microbial degradation and so if the, there's a lot of oil on the bottom in the area of the deep water horizon spill, if it were occurred in 500 meters instead of 1500 meters, how would you expect the bacterial response in the sediments to be different? That's a great question. So the depths that we're talking about in the Gulf of Mexico um, where we've, we've been working routinely are less than 2000 meters, um, true piezophiles kick in at about 3000 meters water depth. But there, there is an effect, and, but it's not for the reason that, that, it's not a pressure per se effect, it's a gas solubility effect. So one of the, one of the papers that, that we published last year um, through EcoGig support had to do with the role of, of methane concentrations on um, metabolic rates in sediments. So if you t determine rates at pressure alone, you get a, a pretty consistent, uh, you, you don't get a, a, methane concentration makes a much bigger difference than pressure alone. So the activity rates at 500 meters water depth versus 1500 meters water depth, if done at the proper sort of cocktail of conditions representing in situ, aren't gonna be that different. So we have a question here that says, what's the ecological impact of the new microbial steady state uh, for oil organisms, I think it's oil, oil organisms in the food web? So, we, tr we spent um, a great deal of effort in EcoGig tracking um, petrocarbon into the food web. Um, and this is, this is digested carbon. So microbes, they oxidize the oil, they assimilate it. It's not harmful, it moves up the food chain. Um, we could see m petrocarbon from the oil spill moving into the food web for five years after the incident. Um, that has tapered off now and it's back to its baseline sort of level. Um, but there are still perturbations in community composition. What we don't know is how the function of those communities has, has changed um, or whether they have changed. Um, the, the, one of the other consequences that hasn't really received enough attention, I think, is that when the MOSFA event occurred, it wasn't just oil that was moving to the benthos. Um, a lot of particulate um, debris got 
moved to the benthos as well. And, and Jason's going to show this on his poster. Um, the area around Macondo was pretty low nutrient, pretty low carbon after before the oil spill. Um, after the oil spill, um, concentrations of, of dissolved inorganic carbon and nutrients in the sediments increased by about a factor of 150 to 500. So there was a reallocation or redistribution, if you will, of nutrients from the surface water down to the, to the benthos. And that's the kind of consequence that doesn't show up in measurements over the short term. It's going to take, you know, 20 years to, to see an impact like that on the system, if, if there is one on the system. Okay. We have one final question. Um, what did you mean by omics enable microbiology as an underappreciated response tool that should be employed and employed how? So I can give you a, a so when, 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 when we use genomics tools, we can fingerprint communities very effectively and very quickly. And you, you can't really do that with microscopy. You can't, you can't go out and, and take a sample and look at it under the microscope and say, okay, this sample is going to degrade oil, right? With genomics data, we can do that. We can, we, can met, we can take a sample, we can bring it into the lab, we can sequence it. I actually have a sequencer in my lab that is about this size. And we can sequence 100 gigabases in less than a day, and we can crunch the data and have a fingerprint of the community in, in the next day. Um, I've run it in my car coming back from a field site. Um, it's really distracting, though, to be tempted to look at the screen and you have to point it the opposite way. Um, but, but we're at a point now where we really have the tools to on the fly, you know, do these measurements. We take the minion out to sea with us and we can sequence on the boat. We don't have to wait till we get home. We can do it on the ship. We can get real time data. If there was an oil spill tomorrow, we could load these minions up, put them on the ship. We can tell you how the population is responding in real time. So that's what I mean by omics enabled. We can do metatranscriptomics on that instrument. We can do metagenomics. We can do methylomics. We can do every, every kind of microbial analysis imaginable in, in really short order. And that means that the, the problem with these techniques has been that the, 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 the lag time between getting the sample and getting the data, that's gone now. We, it's, it's, it's less than a week, so we really can be I think actively and nimbly involved in response, and we can we can, I think, empower and enable our response efforts moving forward. Well, please join me in thanking Mandy for this. Speech.